Thanks very much for joining us for this morning's presentation. It's one of the old chestnuts of ontology of Petrix apex lesions. Um, so, uh, there we are. So, my references are two review articles. Um, the one on the left is particularly good, and the one on the right has lots of pictures. And the thing about Petrix apex lesions is um, they are, it, it's very much about pattern recognition on the various imaging modalities that are available um, that's largely involved in making a diagnosis and guiding treatment. So just as a historical perspective, um, in the, not so long ago, um, it was only really plain skull x-rays that were available for assessing head and neck pathology, and that pathology made things um, very difficult um, and it was only when um, diseases progressed to a point of, for example, Gratinigo syndrome, that, that uh, some pathologies were more easily recognizable. So thankfully, now we have really high res uh, CT scans and the advancement of MRIs from 1.5 Tesla to 3 Tesla, now even 7 Tesla scans that are um, making things a lot, a lot more easy to um, to get a clearer picture of what's going on. Um, so just firstly, in terms of the clinical presentation of Petrix apex diseases in general, many lesions are completely asymptomatic and just an incidental finding on a scan done for another reason. Some of the symptoms are completely nonspecific, uh, like headache, otorrhea, which is sometimes bloody, um, otalgia, retroorbital pain, other, other areas of facial pain, fever and loss of consciousness. Um, when you, it, some larger lesions can produce cranial nerve deficits, um, particularly uh, causing diplopia and the abducens palsy is the most common cranial nerve to be affected causing diplopia. Um, facial pain from involvement of the trigeminal nerve is actually the most common cranial nerve affected overall by all Petrus apex lesions. Um, uh, facial weakness can occur and spasms, sensual hearing loss, tinnitus, vertigo, aspiration, voice, and dysphagia can occur as well. Gravenigo syndrome is um, one of the <coughs> very old um, collections of, of signs and symptoms that are uh, suggestive of Petrus apocytis that we'll get to just now, but basically otorrhea, either due to acute otitis media or chronic otitis media with facial pain that is most commonly retroorbital and diplopia due to abducens palsy. And the, the trial of those uh, signs and symptoms is characteristic for um, Petrus apocytis. So there's a classification of all of the Petrus apex lesions that basically goes according to the different types, so developmental or cystic lesions, inflammatory, neoplastic, being both benign and malignant, and within the malignant ones, even uh, metastases to the Petrus apex, and then vascular lesions, osseous lesions, and variations of normal anatomy, which are called leave me alone lesions because they really aren't normal anatomy. And some post-operative changes. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but certainly the, the main ones um, we can quickly run through, and then an overview of treatment at the end. Um, just quickly a word for Petrus apex lesions in children, unfortunately have a bit of a different differential in that they're much more often malignant, uh, specifically Langerhans cell histocytosis, metaplastic neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma are the, the top ones that come to mind in a child. Um, cholesterol granulomas are the most common of all Petrus apex lesions, but of all cholesterol granulomas, situation in the Petrus apex is actually quite rare. Obviously, it's a much more common pathology to find in the middle ear and mastoid air cell system. There's different theories of pathogenesis. Um, there's a, a new, there's a classical theory and a new theory. Um, and so the, the classical theory is that there's eustachian tube dysfunction causing inadequate Petrus apex ventilation 
resulting in edema of the mucosa, um, which has a, a final common pathway of hemorrhage from the mucosal edema and then anaerobic breakdown of the blood and foreign body reaction. The, the problem with that classical theory is eustachian tube dysfunction is really common and petrocephalic lead and petrocephalic cholesterol granulomas are quite uncommon. Um, so the newer theory says that it may be from excessive pneumatization of the petrocephalics, which exposes marrow in, in, the, in the area, and the exposed marrow is more friable and prone to hemorrhage. Um, so um, petrocephalic lesions uh, classically occur, uh, sorry, cholesterol granulomas of the petrocephalics classically occur in well pneumatized petrocephalics and patients with re recurrent or chronic otitis media. Um, clinically, uh, patients are often asymptomatic and it, it may just be a completely incidental finding. They may present with uh, non-specific symptoms like headache and trigeminal neuralgia, which is not only due to the cholesterol granuloma itself, but often also due to the associated muscle tension and migraine, etc. Uh, they may have unilateral fluctuating conductor hearing loss, tinnitus, and vertigo. They may have a ipsilateral serous otitis media effusion, and the cranial nerve um, deficits being ipsilateral retroorbital pain, diplopia, facial weakness or spasm, and hoarse voice and dysphagia. Uh, the cyst itself has a thick capsule and it's filled with what was initially thought to just be cholesterol, but it's actually a sort of viscous brown fluid with granulation tissue. The imaging signs are um, quite characteristic in that um, on CT scan, you, you just see bony remodeling um, and, and thinning of the bone, but it's not an erosive process. Um, usually in a well pneumatized contralateral petrocephalix would support the, the diagnosis of that being a cholesterol granuloma because usually the petrocephalices are symmetrically pneumatized. On MRI, uh, cholesterol granuloma is basically the only lesion that's hyper intense on T1 and T2 imaging and it's not enhancing uh, with contrast injection. The treatment basically is if it's asymptomatic, just the incidental finding, you can watch and wait with serial imaging. If it is symptomatic, then it should be drained surgically, where the goal of the surgery is to create a permanent drainage and aeration pathway and to preserve the hearing if the hearing is uh, still um, serviceable. There's, two, there's many approaches, but the open transcranial approaches have been extensively described as far back as 2002 by Dr. Brackman and Fo in, in the States. And um, our local faculty has also described the endoscopic transfernodal drainage um, as an alternative approach. The second Quick, um, sort of controversy in, in any approach is whether to stent or not to stent. And thankfully, there's a systematic review in 2014 that shows that simple drainage is adequate. There's no extra value in trying to completely remove the wall of the cyst, and there's no extra benefit of placing a stent. Um, so, for the next topic, uh, cholesterol in the petrous apex are more often congenital than acquired and it's basically a, an aberrant um, collection of exoderm trapped in Cecil's pockets uh, which you can see in the figure on the right hand side um, oh, that? from embryological development. Uh, clinically the patient would present with asymmetrical uh, sensorineural hearing loss which is slowly progressive. They may have a progressive facial weakness or facial spasms and there is um, some cases described of malignant transformation to squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which would be um, uh, suggested if, if a patient has a, a sudden growth of, of the cholesterol after a period of quiescence. 
on imaging, uh, the CT scan typically shows e either bony expansion in the initial stages, but it can sometimes become erosive in, in the very large um, lesions. MRI, like most um, pediatric lesions, is hyperintense on T1 and hyperintense on T2, but then the the um, useful test is that it's, it has a restricted diffusion on diffusion weighted imaging, um, as with cholesterol junction in any other site. With contrast injection, there's no enhancement. So the next lesion is the mucosal, which is the same as a, a mucosal elsewhere in ENT. It's just a post inflammatory obstruction of, a, of any pneumatized air cell. Um, on CT, they're expansile, not erosive, um, and like most lesions, hyperintense on T1 and hyperintense on T2, with no enhancement. Again, the treatment is if asymptomatic, just watch and wait, and if it's symptomatic, then surgical drainage is warranted. Encephalocele's are a protrusion of dura, either as a meningocele or just an arachnoid cyst. Um, there's two sort of broad categories. Um, I think the most commonly seen one is encephalocele from Meckel's cave occurring due to chronic raised intracranial pressure. And that would usually be bilateral, uh, slightly more common in women than men. But it can also occur from other defects in the basal skull, which would either be associated with neurofibromatosis type 1, where there's an association with basal skull dysplasia, or obviously iatrogenic or traumatic. Clinically, patients with a pituitary encephalocele would sometimes be asymptomatic, um, which is why one should, some, in some cases, do a scan before doing a biopsy of a, of a unilateral sinonasal mass. They may present with non-specific symptoms like headache, hearing loss, and CSF oteria, and there is often an association with empty cellar syndrome. There's a lot of literature as to whether there really is a common cause or if it's just an association, but I think that's a bit controversial. And again, treatment is if it's asymptomatic, watch and wait with serial imaging. If it's symptomatic, then it can be obliterated surgically with fat or muscle and the basic skull defect repair. Um, on imaging, um, on the left is a coronal T1 post-catalinium MRI that shows the bilateral encephaloceles in the Meckel's case, as indicated by the asterisks, and the arrow pointing up to an empty cell. On axial T2 on the right, it's the, the you, you just see a high CSF signal, obviously because of the CSF in the lesion. So the next lesion is petrous apocytis, which most commonly occurs, and the pathogenesis is most commonly simply medial extension of an acute hepatic media into a pneumatized petrous apex. Clinically, the patients are usually quite acutely ill. It, it often follows a period of acute hepatic media or, or chronic hepatic media. They would often be febrile, and Grappenego syndrome is the triad of, of oteria, uh, facial pain, typically retroorbital, and diplopia from abducens palsy. Obviously, the complications are that it can spread from the petrous apex to cause meningitis, cere uh, cerebritis or cerebral abscesses, and venous sinus thrombosis. On imaging, um, you can see on the T1 post catalytic in MRI on the left that it's heterogeneously enhancing. Um, but you should also, on, on a scan like that, you should also look for um, extension of the inflammatory process to the adjacent dura to see if there's um, meningitis or cerebral abscesses as well. On the right image, it's a T2 showing a heterogeneously hyperintense lesion in the left petrous apex. Um, and then it, um, you, you can also, um, in some cases, show uh, see a rim enhancing um, post contrast collection, uh, which would suggest a petrous apex abscess, as in the picture there. 
in contrast to Petrus apocytus, you can also get a basal skull osteomyelitis, which um, the, the risk factors are usually um, poorly controlled diabetes. The etiology is either pseudomonas, which occurs as a direct extension from malignant hepatitis externa, or TB, um, which can get to the pituitatics from hematogenous spread. The CT scan initially would just show loss of the normal fat planes beneath the base of skull, but that's quite a subtle sign to see on a CT scan. It, eventually, there may be some bony erosion, but as in malignant hepatitis externa, if if you suspect that a patient has a basal skull osteomyelitis, and if you have the scans available, then a technetium 99 is highly sensitive in the early stages of disease to simply confirm the diagnosis. And then um, gallium 67 and SPECT scans are useful for monitoring the response to treatment and, and um, post-treatment surveillance. Uh, the next lesion is meningiomas, which are usually based on the dura, obviously from meninges adjacent to the petrous apex, so usually in the cerebellar pontine angle and the petrochival area. They tend to spread along the dural tunnel, which is the um, dural lined tunnel for the abducens nerve, or the internal auditory meatus. Um, T1 is usually hypo-intense, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, so T1 is usually hyper intense, and uh, as you can see in the even the post catalinium MRI on the left, it still is hyper intense, and T2 is usually hyper intense, often with a characteristic tail uh, that you can see on the image on the right. Sometimes you get a much larger meningioma that is dumbbell shaped um, with heterogeneous intensities that then can become quite difficult to make an accurate diagnosis. Uh, the next lesion is schwannomas, um, which can occur from any nerve, uh, any myelinated nerve basically. Um, so various cranial nerves, a trigeminal, uh, you can get schwannomas close to the Gasserian ganglion in Mengel's cave, or from the cisternal segment of trigeminal nerve. Facial nerve can have schwannomas, which are usually close to the geniculate ganglion, um, the cochlear and vestibular component of the auditory nerve uh, can have schwannomas uh, in the vestibular one, it could usually be close to the vestibular ganglion in the fundus of the internal auditory canal and may present as a mass in the uh, cerebellar pontine angle. And then the deep petrosal nerve in the petrous part of the carotid canal um, can have a schwannoma that would then be called a primary intraosseous schwannoma. When you have a schwannoma, they, then, they tend to grow and spread either by anti-grade or retrograde spread along the nerves that are involved and eventually its branches and usually cause symptoms by um, and radiological signs by expanding the neural foramina and then eventually extending into either the middle or posterior cranial fossa. Um, on, on imaging the on CT scan, the, the lesion is usually expansile, and then, um, as with most other lesions, T1 is hyperintense, T2 is hyperintense. But then, one of the characteristic signs is that you may see air fluid levels, as on the picture on the left, double arrow, um, which is quite characteristic of schwannomas. And then, with um, gadolinium, there is usually um, enhancement. Paragangliomas uh, in the next lesion, they tend to spread via air salt tracts either from the middle ear or, or jugular foramen. On CT scan, you usually see this moth eaten permeated bony erosion, usually situated around either the jugular foramen or handle or petrous apex. On MRI, you get this characteristic salt and pepper appearance. Um, you can see it on both T1 and T2, but it, it's said to be more clearly and uh, more um, characteristically seen on T1. But the salt is the hyperintensities due to focal hemorrhages, and the pepper is the hyperintensities due to high velocity flow voids in the feeding arteries. And being a vascular tumor, it is uh, contrast enhancing. Um, Chondromas and chondrosarcomas are 
equivalent benign and malignant cousins of each other. Um, they are identical on imaging and distinguishable only by histopathology. And both of them are basically due to degeneration of remnants of endochondral cartilage in, in, in the basal skull, but specifically either on the petrosphenoid synchondrosis um, around the clivus or petroclival synchondroses, um, as indicated on the picture. They can be solitary or multifocal and are usually slowly growing. And they may be sporadic or they may be associated with two other diseases that are not, neither of which are congenital. They occur, they're acquired diseases that, that can be associated with, with chondromas and chondrosarcomas. So Ollier's disease is a congenital skeletal dysplasia and Mafuchi syndrome is um, having multiple enchondromas, um, which is basically just an enlargement of the cartilage in the, usually in the hands and feet but also sometimes in the base of skull. And the significance is that there is potential for malignant transformation. Uh, but future syndrome also gets cutaneous hemangiomas and lymphangiomas. On CT scan, uh, they get these lytic bony lesions with characteristic arc or ring-shaped chondroid calcifications. Uh, that's quite characteristic. On MRI, again, as with most lesions, T1 is hyperintense, T2 is hyperintense, and they are usually heterogeneously enhancing on uh, gadolinium MRI. And one of the childhood malignancies of the petrous apex is arachnomyosarcoma, which would often get to the petrous apex by spread from either the middle ear, mastoid airsal system, or nasopharynx. Um, clinically, one should suspect this if there's a history of chronic otorrhea, sometimes a polyp in the ear canal, um, and multiple cranial nerve palsies. Uh, so the child on the right in two photos has a right abuseless palsy that, that he, he or she can't have up the eye, and a right facial palsy. Um, if you see a, 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 a lesion looking like a rhabdomyosarcoma on a scan, you should also look <coughs> for the, the sort of primary tumor in either the middle ear, mastoid or major pharynx, um, as you can see on the image on the right. Uh, the CT scan usually shows bony erosion. MRI is quite variable intensities on T1 and T2, and contrast shows variable enhancement. Um, so this is one of the lesions where we Often, uh, input from a radiologist is quite useful because there's a lot of variability. The treatment uh, for rhabdomyosarcomas is obviously temporal bone resection if it is still operable and adjuvant radiotherapy. Chordomas are uh, malignant tumors from remnants of the notochord, so usually are situated in the midline, anywhere from basal skull to the sacrum, but obviously they can extend from the midline into the petrous apex. Um, the imaging patterns are that on CT you usually see bony erosion. It's usually centered in or around the clivus. And on MRI, it's again, as with most of the lesions, hyper intense on T1 and hyper intense on T2. And with contrast uh, injection, it's variable enhancement giving a characteristic honeycomb appearance, as you can see with the arrow in the right side of the picture. Uh, endolymphatic sac tumors are usually sporadic and usually unilateral, but if they occur bilaterally, one should consider the diagnosis of von Hippel Lindau syndrome. A uh, CT scan would usually show soft tissue masses with permeated bony erosion, and obviously, because of the situation of the endolymphatic sac along the posterior border of the petrous apex, that's where the tumor would be, uh, the epicenter of the tumor would be located. On MRI imaging, it's, you can see heterogeneous intensities on T1 and T2, but again, the, the situation in the posterior border of the petrous apex is characteristic. Uh, plasma cytomas are quite a rare tumor that can occur either as an intraosseous plasma cytoma from marrow-rich petrous bone, 
or extramedullary plasma sarcoma from the middle ear on asteroid invading into the Beatrice apex. Uh, imaging characteristics are that it's a lytic lesion without a sclerotic rim on CT scan. On MRI, it's again hyper intense on T1 and hyper intense on T2. Uh, with contrast injection, it is enhancing, and the treatment is quite different from all other Beatrice apex lesions in that it is a highly radiosensitive tumor. So, this is one of the few cases where you can give uh, primary radiotherapy. Um, then the, the last category of malignancies would be um, hematogenous metastases uh, from, from other primaries. And the most common lesion is from breast uh, cancers. Come with that up. Um, breast cancers are the, of, of all the metastases in the Petrus apex, breast is the most common primary. Um, the other less common primaries would be renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, and thyroid carcinoma. And those are quite highly vascular metastases, and those would then also give a, a differential diagnosis of a, of a vascular tumor, like a, a glomus tumor. And then the, the not so vascular metastases would be from lung and prostate primaries. Obviously, um, metastases would usually occur in elderly patients. Um, th there's a theory that um, of, of all the leaves, of all the sites on the temporal bone, that they may have a predilection for the Petrus apex over other sites because the blood tends to slow down its, its flow through particularly thick marrow in the Petrus apex. So maybe that allows the metastatic cells to, um, to, to exit the circulation into the Petrus apex. On CT scan, uh, these metastases are usually lytic lesions and on MRI, same as usual, hyperintense on T1 and hyperintense on T2, and there is variable enhancement, which is probably because there's so many different kinds of primaries. Obviously, if you've got intracranial metastases, the treatment would usually be palliative. Um, then we can look at quickly at some vascular treatments of the petrous apex, so either petrous or cavernous carotid aneurysms, which can either be congenital, traumatic, or post-infectious. Sometimes they're completely asymptomatic, um, or they may present with unilateral tinnitus, cranial nerve palsies, or Horner's syndrome. On contrasted CT scan, you usually see a fusiform shape of, as with any other aneurysm, but the location in the carotid canal, as you can see in the top picture, um, is quite characteristic, it's sort of giving a, a clue to the diagnosis. It would usually be contrast enhancing because it's an aneurysm, but you can get a, a, a non-contrast enhancing lesion if it has already thrombosed. And then on MRI, um, you can see heterogeneous intensities in the lumen, which are caused by both turbulent flow in the aneurysm and also mural thrombi. Um, then just quickly on some of on two of the variants of normal anatomy. Um, which are called leave me alone lesions because that should be the treatment. Um, so they may occur in five to ten percent of normal populations. Um, on CT scan, you can see asymmetric pneumatization in, in and, and normal trabeculae, um, as, as in the picture on the right. You can still see some trabecular structures in the in the left features apex and obviously asymmetrical pneumatization. Um, on MRI, you can see a variable signal intensity. There's a few theories behind this. Firstly, children have more red marrow in the petrous apex, which gives an intermediate signal intensity. And adults have a more fatty marrow, which is usually hyperintense on T1 and hypointense on T2. So that's the opposite of the usual um, pattern of most petrous apex lesions. Um, the, the diagnosis of this asymmetry can be confirmed with fat suppression sequences, which is a, a separate sort of sequence that the radiologist can organize. Um, lastly, a petrous apex effusion is just like an effusion elsewhere in the middle ear or mastoid air cell system. So obviously on CT scan, there would be no bony expansion or erosion. 
there would be a hyper intense on T1 and a hyper intense on T2, and obviously not contrast enhancing. So, just briefly, as a brief overview of the treatments of petrosapex lesions in general, it would depend on many factors. The, the patient factors would be their age, health, life expectancy, fitness for anesthesia, the, the, the hearing, and whether it's still serviceable or not, and obviously patient preference. The pathological factors would be the severity of the symptoms of, the, of whatever lesion. Um, if you are doing a, a watch and wait kind of management, then the speed of growth on serial imaging um, and histology, if it's available, can also guide the treatment. And then institutional factors obviously are quite important um, with uh, the experience of surgical and uh, oncological personnel and the availability of lots of specialized equipment, both for treatment and investigation. So the options would then be watch and wait, which would be a, a valid option for elderly unfit patients with mild symptoms and a lesion that's presumed to be benign, and that would then be done by serial imaging. Drainage and mass utilization, which would be, can be done through various approaches, as I said before. So either a transcanal, transmastoid, there's various approaches, or the transphenoidal approach as described earlier. Um, surgical excision is obviously an option, and in, in cases of malignancy, one may offer adjuvant uh, radiotherapy. And then primary radiotherapy is sometimes an option, which can be given either as stereotactic um, IMRT or proton beam therapy. Uh, so just briefly on some of the approaches, the open transcranial approaches obviously were developed first and they would be categorized into those sparing or preserving the hearing or those sacrificing auditory structures. So pre preserving the hearing would be a transcanal infracochlear approach, infralabyrinthine approach or retrosigmoid and obviously middle cranial fossa would preserve hearing but has significant uh, morbidities as well. Approaches that sacrifice the auditory structures would be transotic, transcochlear, or translabyrinthine. And then obviously uh, the endoscopic endonasal approaches to the petrous apex can either be purely transnasal, transethmoidal, or transseptal, but either way would end up in a sphenoidotomy to give access to the petrous apex, which would be then accessed through the posterior lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. Um, so the infralabyrinthine approach would be performed by doing a cortical mastoidectomy, drilling out Troutman's triangle, which is the triangle between superposal sinus, sigmoid sinus, and posterior semicircular canal. Um, expose the sigmoid sinus to the jugular bowl, skeletonize semicircular canals, and then follow the infralabyrinthine aerosol tract anteriorly until you get to the petrous apex. Um, Last slide, I think, is just two surgical approaches for um, petrous apex um, in, in showing a nice contrast of a transcanal infracochlear approach uh, where you lift a tympanometal flap, transcanal, you, you drill this area of the bone highlighted in green, trying to avoid the jugular, carotid, and cochlea to access the, the in this case, uh, a cystic lesion. Um, but obviously it's, it's a narrow little gap to, to go through. There's obvious risks of, of the adjacent structures, but also the risks of having a very narrow drainage pathway post-operative, which is then prone to recurrence of the pathology. And in contrast, uh, here's a post-operative picture of an endoscopic transphenoidal approach, um, which leaves a wide drainage pathway, uh, which is um, if performed in experienced hands, quite safe. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much uh, for attending. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, yeah, good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. This is Jos. I just have a question. Uh, what is your most common biopsy approach if you tend to do that? A profilactically dependent, obviously, on the, the site of the lesion and proximity to adjacent important structures. Um, so it looked like you saw in the, in the last slide a Trans, uh, trans endoscopic endonasal transphenoidal approach is um, gives a, a fairly um, wide access to, to biopsy things, um, but it, it, it would depend on the site of the, of the lesion, I think. Yeah, so, so the quality of the biopsy, because that's important, especially when you're having. Uh, so are you, you won't be able to use a core needle. You'll have to use um, what's called an instrument that actually um, sort of ranges little pieces out. I, can't, I don't know what the name is. Yeah, so yeah. The, qual the quality of your biopsy, if it's fragmented or if it's a core, anything like this, because that can be important, especially if you want to assess... Uh, Perhaps the edge of the tumor margins. Um, so, so what? What in general can you produce? So, I mean, so it's Darlene Lebeau from uh, UCT. Um, the the easiest way is the endoscopic transnasal. So you come from the usually from the contralateral side, but it all depends on whether your lesion extends uh, to the sphenoid sinus. Obviously, if it goes into the sphenoid sinus, it's easy. Um, but sometimes, if you specifically look at the cholesterol granulomas um, if they, or the mucosils, if they, if they haven't expanded enough, you know, your uh, internal carotid artery can be in the way. But if there's a small corridor, that, because often for the uh, cholesterol granulomas, you actually have to draw past the carotid uh, um, uh, canal and go around it. But otherwise, I mean, you can give a, if, if it's a big lesion, you can get a big biopsy. So you can get the capsule, you can get the insides. I mean, normally we would just use a, a Blakesley forceps. You definitely don't want to try and pour anything because of your proximity to the, to the carotid. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it's um, Tashini Harris here. Just, um, I think this is the one. Uh, Petrus apex is just so difficult to access. I think that's the, the first thing. And you very reliant on your radiologist to call it, and they they basically have to put their heads in a block and say this is what I think it is. Um, and then obviously it also requires a bit of experience as to whether you think this lesion has read the textbook or not. And I'm sure Donnie will. Will agree here that sometimes you get cholesterol granulomas. It doesn't look like a typical cholesterol granuloma. For cholesterol, obviously you have to operate, so you're dependent on your diffusion weighted MRI. So there, they really have to get it right because that requires surgery in all cases, um, and the surgery is destructive. Um, you know, how, however small that petrous apex cholesterol is, it's still destructive in terms of getting there. That's the first, first thing. So you have to have a radiologist who really trust is going to give you the right diagnosis. And then the second thing is, is like Darlene says, you, you, you're basically dependent on the scan, which is going to show you the least invasive way to get to that peach's apex. And often that is transmonoidal. And if it's a, if it's a peach's apex and there's not much going anteriorly and there's a lot of bone to access transmonoidally, but you can see in for cochlea, it's pretty much still sitting in the hypertemponum, except for a little bit of bone, and that's the easiest route to access. But where there's a lot of bone, the infralabyrinthine route is not an option. And also depends on whether you've got cells leading to the petrous apex. So in very dense um, petrous apex lesions where it's not well pneumatized and you don't have that infralabyrinthine route, there's no cells to draw out, you haven't drawn through very thick bone. 
So you're dependent on the CT scan there to really determine your access into whether it's biopsy or whether it's surgical wound. But they are difficult, and I think the as, as you say, often uh, what happens is you often get the no touch lesions, and then as a surgeon, you have to make sure that the radiologist has done the fat suppression images and make sure you ask for it. And also make sure you ask for a DWI uh, image on every petrous apex uh, region to exclude a cholesteatoma. So if they haven't done the fat suppression images, they're going to say this is something else that's and it's probably normal. Well, I agree. So just Neil and I would always sit and together, first of all, you know, um, decide what is the safest approach, the best approach, and the least destructive approach, whether it's endoscopically through the nose or um, to the kind of temporal bone. But it's, it's uh, you know, I agree with the, you have to really chat to the radiologist because some of these lesions, if it's a small petrous apex, cholesterol granuloma, or small mucus seal, it's actually easier to leave it um, and wait for it to, to uh, become more accessible through the nose. But then you need to be make sure it's not a cholesterol or metastases. So you really need to, you don't want to sit on something like that. So it is important to, to sit down with the radiologist. Does somebody mention the issue of stenting versus not stenting for cholesterol granulomas? Yeah. Uh, well, Colleen, do you want to comment on your experience? Yeah, so, so we always try and put us for the cholesterol granulomas, we always try and put a stent in because it's Usually, so much information in that area, so it's like a mucus seal. So, even although you can get a big opening, um, you know, it's most likely going to close up. So, you try to put a little tube of some sort in there um, and leave it in as long as, as possible because then it's easy to replace it. I mean, it's so quick to take the patient back to theater and just replace it with the tube. But it all depends on your access, how much space you have to get into that lesion. If it's a if it's an expensive thing into the sphenoid, then obviously a stent probably is not even necessary, it'll just fall out. But if it's a, if you can get a two, three millimeter stent in there, then I would, I would put it in. And then you can later on remove it and then you have like a little fistula into the nose. And then, um, and what's your success rate being with grading your bridge shop and um, well, we haven't really looked at the, at the results, but I mean, just from the patients that come come back to us, um, I can't really remember of anybody that we had to, to take back again, you know. Um, maybe in the beginning there was one or two. Um, it's quite rare. I mean, I haven't, I haven't done one for about a year, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, when you're bothered by, by the, by the trust, uh, a little possible approach because I'm not sure where it drains to. You want to comment on that? Well, features are big. Features are So, it's a British shock and learners. So, I've, I've never done the feature, the middle fossil approach for cholesterol granulomas. I mean, I think because we need. 95% of the time don't even access a transphenoid link. Yeah. Uh, but yes, as you as you rightly say, it doesn't drain anywhere, so it's yeah. difficult. And if you have to go that route, it means that's the only route that's accessible. Yeah. You know? So the, the transnasal route is it's such a nice route. I mean it's nice surgery to do it's um obviously with your carotid and a seat you have to decide whether you can get around those two things. Um, but for the patient, it's, a, you know, it's similar to having an endoscopic sinus surgery. Um, it's very minimally invasive and it's very easy to go back again. It remains a challenge in the career. Any more questions or comments? So, thank you very much. It's very, very detailed presentation. Excellent. If there's no other comments from the floor, then we can close the meeting. Thanks very much for attending, and the next uh, next presentation will be next week, Wednesday. Thanks so much again.